We have a talk about counter-lobbying EU institutions, and please let us welcome Christian Balz and Jeremy Zimmermann for this talk. Please give them a warm round of applause. Hello, wie geht's? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, it's. A great pleasure to be here uh, as usual, it's uh, a honor. Um, I'm very happy to be here with uh, Christian from Mogis. I'm uh, Jeremy Zimmerman, I'm the co-founder of La Quadrature du Net. We're a citizen organization, a kind of toolbox for citizens to understand what's going on when their fundamental freedoms are attacked online, and tools for everyone to try to participate into the democratic debate. You may have heard of our campaigning efforts on net neutrality or ACTA or on the telecoms package. And I'm, I'm very glad to, to share the floor here uh, with Christian uh, from Mogis uh, because we are working, while working on apparently different issues, we are actually working uh, towards the very same objectives of defending a free and open internet and I think he's doing an excellent job. So it's my pleasure. Maybe you can introduce uh, Mogis, Christian. Um, yeah, most of the people in the room might know Mogus, probably from the German debate on access blocking. And I actually I have to return the favor because uh, <laughs> you know, without Jeremy and La Quatre du Dieu and La Quatre du Dieu, uh, the success we had in 2010 uh, would have not been as it was. Can I get it to get the different microphone? <laughs> so, um, we are living interesting times indeed. Um, this year has been an incredible acceleration of various attacks on our freedoms. You all know what I'm talking about. It's useless to try to make an exhaustive account of all the pressures that are threatening us here in our Western democracies and all around the world on our ability to access a neutral, therefore free, internet. Um, what is extremely interesting is the convergence of these attacks. On one hand, you can look at the war against our free access to the internet from the angle of censorship, political censorship you see in uh, China, Iran, Pakistan and such friendly democracies. Or uh, you can see it from the angle of censorship coming to Europe, coming to a democracy near you in the name of um, child pornography or child abuse material, more precisely, or online gambling or whatsoever. You can look at the, the war against the free access to the internet through the angle of the copyright wars, the war against sharing, why we should at all costs ban people from sharing bits on the internet. You can also look at it from the point of view of the internet operators. Why wouldn't we make money restricting access to the internet? All those good reasons at once are increasingly coming in our faces to make the internet a balkanized assemblage of sub-networks that may ultimately lose the universality that is the key feature to the internet. Okay, when, when we say that, we say about everything and about nothing at once, because you all know what I'm talking about. You also all know about those strange political entities, and we can barely call them entities, that we've seen in the last months appearing on the stage. We've seen WikiLeaks teaching the world how important it is to publish information that is held secret for wrong reasons. We've seen those indignados, indigné, however you call them, occupy movements that for various reasons coordinated themselves and gave huge uh, amount of uh, noise and pressure on some issues. We all have in mind those anonymous lolsec, antisec, whoever, who rose attention, massive attention, on question of computer security that were mostly unheard before outside of our nerdy hacker circles. And so we're here as citizens in the middle of it. On one end, 
is this global war against knowledge, this global war against freedom of online that we are witnessing every day. And on the other hand, are those entities that organize themselves in some vaporous way with no center, with no mass, with no gravity, with no head, with nothing. And we all feel the power that those organizational models bear, right? We all use those free software and Wikipedia and so on for so many years that we integrate into our ways of life, the power of the, the crowd. Well, the question is, how can we use this intelligence, this wisdom, this still free network to try to change something? So, we start with the, the postulate, can you say that? Yeah? We have to postulate that only the people who think that there is nothing we can do about it will do nothing about it and can, cannot do anything about it. For the rest of us, we know that there, there are things we can do to change things. So we start with that. And the question, question is how to go further. Uh, you know Mogis and La Quadrature du Net for constantly spamming you with information about ah, this is going on in the European Parliament, in the jury committee with this and that reporter doing that on that amendment that day. <laughs> so we are here inside the institutions, not because we like it, but because we think it is useful to extract information, extract meaningful information from those information to give it to you and to give it to anyone who might do something about it. So we are not saying here that acting towards the European Parliament or the Commission or how is it called? The, the, the Council? Of, Council. Yeah, this, this thing. Ministers. Well, we, uh, we, we do not say that this is the only way to go, that this is the only thing to do. And of course it is not, because it is about creating a political context on our issues. It is about changing the minds of the people one at a time. It is about making all issues big, hot, on the table, impossible to avoid. And all this, and I hate to use this term, all of this is politics. Not politics with an uppercase P like the party politics or the politicians, we call them in French, homme politique, political men or women. No, it's not that politics. It's the politics of people caring about the society around them and trying to change it. And this is what we can try to do. And this is, well, we have some examples in the past of victories, and we're here to tell you about the next victories we'll have in the EU institutions in order to try to reach that goal. So we'll discuss a bit the EU institutions. <laughs> you all recognize Mrs. Nelly Cruz. <laughs> um, She's the European Commissioner for Digital Agenda, so she's in charge of doing nothing <laughs> on our issues. And, well, this is uh, a beautiful picture of her doing nothing, actually. <laughs> and I think it's quite emblematic, uh, actually, of, um, of the way she is acting or non-acting right now on the question of net neutrality. This is one of the hottest issues we have on the table as La Quadrature du Net at the moment on the EU level. So let me tell you this in the form of a, of a kind of anecdote that will give you a very precise idea of where we stand and what we can do on net neutrality. We triggered a vast uh, debate around the telecoms package on the question of net neutrality, but were a bit late or short of um, campaigning power to impose our view in the second reading in the text. But the Parliament was shaken with this question and asked the Commission, oh, and by the way, we accept the telecoms package as it is, but acknowledge that net neutrality is an important issue. We would be very grateful if you could just, you know, work on it and tell us what to do next. So it was a way for the Parliament not to ignore the problem, just the, the next step after ignoring the problem. Just say, oh, there might be a problem and kick the problem out so somebody else should do something about it. So, instead of the six months, I think, that were initially planned, Nili Cruz took one year and a half to give a report on net neutrality that basically says eh, nothing. It's a 12-page document 
when one week before um, a commission in the French Parliament, in the uh, Economic Affairs Committee of the French Parliament, gave a 90 pages report on net neutrality saying that there was a problem, it was urgent to take action, and there should be a concrete law proposal about it. Well, that was 90 pages in the French Parliament. Nelly Cruz gives 12 pages saying, ah, there might not be a problem after all. And if there is one, well, we'll ask this European body of regulators to do a study to tell us if there is a problem. And if there is a problem, maybe we can try to start thinking of something to do about it. And that's how Nelly Cruz sent with the head in a bucket. So, we're currently right here when Nelly Cruz is expecting results from BEREC, which is a body of European regulator. I don't know, what's the name of the German uh, agency for telecom mm. regulation? Gott. The equivalent of French? Bundesnetzagentur. Bundesnetzagentur? Yes. I said that correctly? Okay. Bundesnetzagentur. So, uh, BEREC is the body that um, rassembles the 27 Bundesnetzagenturs of uh, the European... No, no, come on, come on. <laughs> Well, the, the 27 RCEP, that's the French one, it's easier. Um, and they're in charge of a fact-finding exercise on net neutrality. So they will go, you know, with a magnifying glass, looking at the cables in 27 countries. <laughs> they will come back with their suitcase with lots of stickers from all the 27 countries. And maybe after some months, they will find that either, the, oh, there is no problem with net neutrality, or maybe they will find there is one. And this is clearly a place where we can exert our influence, and this is what we are doing right now. We launched um, a citizen reporting platform called RespectMyNet, respectmynet.eu or respectmy.net, on which people, citizens, well, hackers mostly, can come and say, okay, I'm in Germany, I'm on Vodafone, I got this mobile type of contract, and my port 22 is blocked. Yeah. And you can come and say, oh, Vodafone, Germany, that's my contract, my port 22 is blocked too, I confirm that. And that's more than 70 reports confirmed all around Europe in, I think, nine member states at the moment over more than 25 operators where problems with net neutrality are reported. So we went to see with the people from BEREC. They know about Respect My Net already. We encourage all of you people to go and do some reporting, confirm the reports already in the database, and then we will print a long sheet of paper with all the reports, and we will wrap Berek with it. We will wrap Nelly Cruz, or I don't know. But we'll make it a big physical object, and we'll take photos of it, and we'll bring in front of them the day before they will say whether there is a problem or not, because we all know there is a problem. So it is a few nights of coding in Python and Django, and I, I thank so much Steph for the incredible work he's, he's doing on that. But that's, well, that's quite simple coding and simple campaigning on a very topical issue to make it much, much, much more difficult for Mrs. Cruz to keep her head in the bucket <laughs> on the question of net neutrality. And maybe, Christian, there's something similar about the issues you're working on with child filtering and the, the attitude of the, the institutions. And I think you have, you have uh, things to say about how the EU institution react to on one hand, the, the, the pressure that you may exert or the pressure that some kind of weird, let's call it an industry, may exert on them? Um, Do you see this wait-and-see approach as a, strategical, as, as a political strategy from the EU legislature? Well, um, when I first saw your slide with the bucket, I was thinking about it. And actually, it's like her putting her head in the sand. And um, when I was thinking about uh, putting head in the sand, I was thinking about the Arab world and the uprisings we have there, and about all the lawful interception software that is being sold to the Arab world for intercepting and surveillance. And actually, she was asked about it, and then she said something about self-regulation. Self if self-regulation would work for these digital arms dealers, they would already be self-regulating them. Because the press that they get from selling this stuff to uh, such countries is not very good. So if self-regulation would work, it would have happened in the past. So she just put her head in the bucket in the beginning of December when being asked, so what do you do about the lawful interception being sold to Syria? And 
<coughs> to add to that, it's quite interesting that she has the no disconnect strategy, which actually tries to connect uh, dissidents to the internet. Actually, I believe part of a disconnect strategy would be to work on the companies who do the lawful interception. So, uh, um, how can I say this uh, no disconnect strategy, for example, doesn't look serious in that regard because then this uh, controlling this digital arms dealing, at least from the European Union, would be part of a no disconnect strategy, especially because what happens to the people there, the worst that happens to them is not that they are being disconnected from the internet in Syria, they just die. So uh, we should take that a little more serious and Especially then, perhaps you might have realized that in Germany there was a big uprising about Gutenberg. Yeah, about <laughs> Gutenberg, who represents the no disconnect strategy. Uh, apart everything that has been said about Gutenberg, there are two things that should not be lost in the focus. Gutenberg never finished anything. He's not trustworthy. He never finished anything. He did not finish his degree. He did not finish the reform of the German Bundeswehr. And there are lots of other projects that are left undone, that he just started. So um, I think for, everybody in, for anybody interacting with Mr. Gutenberg, you should make sure that whatever you start gets finished. <laughs> but and maybe the other he knows more about the internet than most politicians. <laughs> yes, you know, it's like, like saying, oh, you know, like, like a moth knows a lot about a light bulb. You know, he ran into it <laughs> and he got burned by it. So he knows about light bulbs, uh, sorry, the he, internet, he the power. Knows, he knows about copy and paste already. No, he knows about the power of the constitu constituents to hold their electees to uh, whatever. Um, yes, we should really be talking about that. The other thing is like this involvement of the CSIS, some American organization doing policy making and now steering the policy of the European Commission. Looks a little strange. Perhaps she should be doing the policy herself. I mean, that's why she's a commissioner. <laughs> and so actually she puts her head in the bucket uh, perhaps she wants to redo the, uh, the no disconnect strategy. You know, it's very modern to put a 2.0 on everything. So perhaps a no disconnect 2.0, uh, where they involve the uh, activists from the beginning and perhaps set up a working group, like a serious working group, with the people actually doing the stuff, who have had, who has, the, who have the expertise and who have the standing to do that. But you asked me about like my interaction with the commission. You know. This, this net neutrality is the one thing. You have the telecoms operators who don't want a neutral internet because then they can sell services. And, and the hardware manufacturers who want to sell ah, more yes. of those so-called smart network. Yes, equipment. you need more processing power if you have DPI. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the, the other thing is where a lot of agenda setting happens is this like child protection on the internet. So one thing is you have the like, primary child protection, child protection against abuse. And then you have like a newer movements like the coalition for to make the internet a better place for kids. Well, I would call for the coalition to make the world a better place for kids first. But um, anyway, uh, so this coalition just started. Actually, it's also done by the same women. It's, it's part of a digital agenda, this uh, making internet a better part for kids. So it started on the 1st of uh, December. It has about 27 founding members. It's like almost every important hardware vendor for your so-called smartphones. And then a few media providers like RTL in Germany and other, other media outlets. And they're all working together to make the internet a better place for kids. <laughs> Perhaps they want to make the internet a second kindergarten, something that you can, can put your child in front of like a TV, for example. Actually, I wouldn't put my child in front of a TV nowadays. Um, perhaps in front of a computer, but not in front of a TV. Um, anyway, these, you have, what you have to understand about these movements, that some, the commission initiates a working plan on something, and then you have all the people like flocking to it. And especially in this topic, you have what I now call the child, child rights industry. I call them the child rights industry because they are industry. They are depend on uh, their cash flow. And their cash flow is being driven by your desire to help children. So they depend on you saying, oh, that poor child. Oh, I want to help that organization. When I came here th this morning, I was asked, 
Um, my name is Evelyn. Uh, hast du zwei Minuten? My name is Evelyn. Do you have two minutes? Well, ah, she asked about my name. My name is Evelyn. What is your name? Well, I didn't say it, but anyway. And I talked to her. First, I thought she was Scientology. No, she wasn't with Scientology. She was with UNICEF. She was with UNICEF? <laughs> yeah. Uh, she, oh, she opened her, her map. So first, I thought it was Scientology. I knew that questions from Scientology, but not from UNICEF. So she was with UNICEF and she wants to raise money. And so they say, what cool they did. You know, they work on making the internet a safer place for children and against child porn, whatever. And they said, I'm sorry, I am against child porn blocking. I am against the blocking infrastructure. How can you dare? I'm sorry, I'm like the member of an organization of victims of sexual abuse. And for us, is blocking is not the right solution. Anyway, so you have this big industry and they have one problem. Their market share depends on how many children there are. And nowadays in Europe, there are <laughs> less children every year. So their market is getting smaller every year. So they redefine what a child is. So nowadays, a child is not somebody before the age of uh, sexual majority. Nowadays, a child is a person under 18. Under the new child exploitation directive, a child is a person who looks like a child, like a person under 18. Just have a look at the directive by, the, by Dunn just now that we finished. It says a child is uh, like child pornography is like pornographic images of a child or a person appearing to be a child. And this can mean like a lot of people. So they are enlarging their market. They are enlarging the problem that they are working on, the problem of child pornography. It's not about child abuse images anymore. That's why I tell you don't use the word child pornography. If you use the word child pornography, you're already in that trap. If you want to fight child abuse images, call them child abuse images. It's really important that you get that right. Actually, I have two litmus tests for child, to distinguish between child rights activists and the child rights industry. The first litmus test is whether they say child pornography or child abuse material or child abuse images, whether they use pornography, the word pornography or not, because it's not pornography. If they understand that, then they are into child rights activists. And the second test I use is about uh, male genital mutilation. You know, if they, are about, if they are about children's rights, they care for girls and boys on the same. But the child rights industry only cares about female genital mutilation because that happens in Africa. It happens in Africa and you can raise money to fight it. If it happens in Europe or the US, it's difficult to raise money to, to fight it. Oh, raise money to fight male genital mutilation. Good luck. <laughs> it's a big part of American uh, culture, 80%. So it's like mainstream. G start fighting us because of the right of the child to be intact. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, from, that's my two litmus tests. Hmm. The first is child pornography. Like most of the child uh, rights industry fail the first test. And so which ones do you find in the EU Commission in Brussels? <laughs> you know what you find. You find the guys who like our political mainstream, this is the European political mainstream is to fight child abuse on the internet and to use technological measures to do this. For example, you have this, the red one, this is uh, the um, advertisement for the written declaration 29. <clears throat> the written declaration 29 was about uh, an early warning system for pedophiles and they wanted to use uh, your search data to do that early warning system and they advertised this early warning system uh, as being similar to the earning early warning system for food. It's very interesting and what it had hidden in, in is down there you had this like collection of search data and data mining search data and half of the European Parliament signed the written declaration 29 motivated by pictures like that and by nice looking women standing in front of the Parliament in Strasbourg and forcing them to sign. And so you have these people, they, they work on the Commission constantly and they get money from the Commission to do so. There is the Inexo project and the Safe Internet project. A part of the Safe Internet project is the Internet for Kids Coalition. The thing is about the Internet Kids Coalition, why I mention this is because it's still open for input. You can still register with them, register for the working program until the 15th of January 2012, because their working plan is for 2012. Get into that. They have uh, five working groups working on five different topics. A few of them are like uh, block. Yes. If you, 
a few of them are about uh, parental control, which might be not as bad as, for example, uh, uh, reporting harmful content or content classification, for example. So you have to get involved with the European Commission to work on that before they even propose legislation. It's the same, you don't go there to get, uh, how can I say, to get through what you want, but you are there to get the information and perhaps steer the discussion process a little. Because it then, when it becomes a legis legislative proposal, it's not as bad as it would have been without our involvement. So if you involve early, what they propose is not as bad. And then when it gets into the legislative process, we can even make it less bad. This is my opinion about involving with the European Commission. The earlier you start, the more influence you have on the process. They won't do what we want, but at least we can steer a little bit the discussion process. Similar to the Child Exploitation Directive, where thanks to Joe McNamee from EDRI, uh, we had an early warning. And so when the directive, the proposal for the directive came out, uh, I already had my appointments made in the European Parliament to talk with the parliamentarians about the proposal before they read it. And uh, actually, that's what I was. I would. I would propose. So, if you like that part of the population that cares about what happens to the internet, then probably a little bit more involvement is needed than just waiting for the next outrage. Actually, you have to involve with them. You have, it's you know sometimes reading a web page for proposals. For they ask for input. The commission asks for input. They ask for input for everything, you know, and then you have all the, chi the uh, child's protection industry and the other industries, they have their lobbyists, they are paid to watch their pages, and they give their input, but we don't. Well, th that's, that's the point, I think, is that we, um, we are here to do this preparatory work. Well, I, I, I say we, in general, as the organizations and the people who are more or less full-time the head, into the, the EU institutions. We provide the input. We, as La Quadrature du Net, have seen most of the head of unit in the European Commission uh, who are caring about copyright, copyright enforcement, and the e-commerce directive. And we're now in direct contact with them. We send them links. Uh, we send them analysis when we produce them, and so on. So we, we, we do this work with more and more uh, experience and knowledge uh, along the years. But this by, by itself is not enough. This is what you said. We need the involvement, the, the participation of citizens who care about that. And the, 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 the point is, in, in what you describe, it is so obvious with the, the, the child abuse and the child rights industry people. Uh, it is also obvious when we talk about uh, security um, that emotional arguments are used to make something go through. It's storytelling, it's elements of language that come along a, um, a law proposal or amendments or whatever. And this is, this is the way the lobbyists work. This is, they probably learn that if there is such a thing as lobbyist school. Uh, they, they learn that. You give a very good reason to the people you want to do something to do it. And then you tell them what to do. And this is the way it works. So they have the very strong and very emotional arguments about that. But we are right. So how can we do it? How can we explain to them that we are right when they come with such an emotional uh, load of cute looking kids with obviously a full photography um, set and studio in front of her, uh, asking her to look so cute and in this full distress. Wh what can we do? I mean, will lolcats be enough to counter the cute? <laughs> this is one question that seriously needs to be, um, to be addressed. And don't laugh, well, laugh if you want to laugh, but I think that lolcats are part of the answer, actually. <laughs> because, because we are the internet. Because we own the internet, we make the internet every day. And we know that this is using this internet that we can do something about anything we might be able to do something about, right? So the, the, the question is really about articulating the work towards the institution with the, 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 the drive of not somebody like you, fellow politicized hackers, but somebody like the friends of the friends of your family who might find that the lolcat on the internet is cool 
that downloading music is cool, then chatting with uh, people from India is cool, and so on. But don't realize that all this may be threatened today. Um, I think we'll have a wonderful occasion to practice on the ACTA fight that is now beginning in the European Parliament. Who among you never heard about ACTA? Yay, that's no hand. Well, one or two. Okay, so for the, the one or two hands, ACTA is the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. It is, well, w I'll show you a little video that will tell you m more than I can do in such a short period of time about ACTA. Um, it's the Shakespearean tragedy of how democracy can be circumvented to achieve control over the internet. There are international organizations where such issues of intellectual property, end of quote, uh, can be discussed. But ACTA aims at circumventing even those international institutions because they don't um, obeying enough to what the US-based industry wants them to do. So this is an ad hoc forum designed to circumvent democracy. The more, most sneaky language uh, is inside about cooperation of the ISPs to take measures to deter further infringement or else you face criminal sanction for aiding and abetting infringement on a commercial scale, which could translate that if you're operating machines on the internet, you will get screwed unless you deploy censorship measures. But there is a small, very small bug in their plan of imposing ACTA to the EU, the US, their um, 12 negotiating partners, and ultimately to the rest of the world indeed. There is a little tiny bug into it. Is that since the Lisbon Treaty that entered into force actually well after the, the ACTA began to be negotiated, according to the Lisbon Treaty, the European Parliament now has to say yes or no to any trade agreement. And ACTA is disguised as a is disguised as a trade agreement. So the European Parliament will have one vote, one occasion to say yes or no to ACTA. So this is where we come into play. This process has just begun in the European Parliament. I won't bore you with the, the, the procedural details, the, the Council of the EU, the ministers just gave the dossier to the European Parliament. So now the fight begins. There will be a vote in no less than three months, it could take forever, it will most probably be in the first part of 2012, but before that final vote, there will be subcommittees of the European Parliament who all will, will discuss and vote on an opinion. This will be as many stages before the final one, where we'll have an occasion to intervene, to call the members of these committees and say you cannot, you cannot let that wording into your opinion. You have to put that and that and that. You have to take into account the um, legal uncertainty it brings to the, 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 the internet companies. You have to take into account the risk for fundamental freedoms. You have to take into account the, the risk for access to healthcare, to access to, to, to seeds and biodiversity and so on and so on. We'll have to constantly go to the members of the parliament in charge of these committees until the pressure will be high enough. So the few days before the final vote, the yes or no vote, everybody on the fucking interwebs will be aware that there will be a tough vote in the European Parliament we should care about. That's the plan. And you all have a role in that plan. So this is an example of where once again, we'll be inside the parliament to tell you now is the time to call the people from the industry committee where the list is here. Thanks to our tool, political memory, you'll be able to just you know, click them and call them using voice over IP or some other very cool fancy technology we didn't deploy yet, but will soon. Um, we will be there to blow in the whistle and say, hey guys, this is important now. There is this and this and that, but it's not enough. It's not only following uh, instructions or reading a script uh, that would help us to get there. It is every possible invention, means of action that could be invented to make people aware about ACTA, 
to make the members of the parliament aware that people are aware about ACTA, because this is ultimately how we set the political context. You know this uh, reptilian part of the brains of a politician that constantly every few cycles checks whether or not he has chances to be re-elected. This is to that part of the brain that ultimately we speak. If the issue is hot enough, if everybody is enraged against anyone who may vote yes on ACTA, then the finger will tremble when it will get next to the voting machine. And this is precisely the effect we want to get. So, as uh, it will soon be time to open for questions, because the more trolling and, well, uh, the, the more input and feedback and so on, the, the, the more useful and entertaining this can be. Um, I'll show you a small movie. Well, I'm actually very proud of it. I, I have to, to, to show off. Policing everything you do online? Can you imagine generic drugs that could save lives being banned? Can you imagine seeds that could feed thousands being controlled and withheld in the name of This will become reality with ACTA. ACTA is the anti-counterfeiting trade agreement. Disguised as a trade agreement, ACTA goes much, much further than that. For the past three years, ACTA has been negotiated in secret by 39 countries. But the negotiators are not democratically elected representatives. They don't represent us, but they are deciding laws behind our backs. Bypassing our democratic processes, they impose new criminal sanctions to stop online file sharing. ACTA aims to make internet service and access providers legally responsible for what their users do online. Turning them into private copyright police and judge censoring their networks. The chilling effects on free speech would be terrible. In the name of patents, ACTA would give large corporations the power to stop generic drugs before they reach the people who need them and to stop the use of certain seeds for crops. The European Parliament will soon vote on ACTA. This vote will be the occasion to say no once and for all, to this dangerous treaty. As citizens, we must urge our representatives to reject ACTA. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I'm very proud of this, this bit uh, of film. It has been seen one million times in the first week we published it. It reached number 52 most viewed video on YouTube that week, and number one most viewed and most favorited video in the news and politics section of YouTube the week we, we released it. So to everyone telling you, oh, Akta, well, nobody cares about it anyway. You can tell them that the video got much more attention than any video from their political party or whatever got so far. But that's an example. We, we had a, a volunteer animator working for TV who did that for us. His intern spent one month doing it. And to me, it's a wonderful example of what you can do, not with one more press release or a blog entry or anything, but really using uh, vivid, colorful image symbols or anything else than we do usually to convey the very same message. So this is one example among many others and I hope, um, yeah, I think we can open the floor uh, now so maybe you suggest other ways of action or you tell us of your ways of action or ask questions or whatever. And yes, thank you very much for your, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay, now for the Q&A session, could you please raise your hand and we'll have a microphone come over to you and you, need, uh, you can use the microphone over there. Just one here first and one here first. Hello, um, uh, as a Spaniard myself, I've been seeing these things happening every now and then. We, we have actually changed our government and we thought we, we got rid of our part of ACTA thing in Spain, but we didn't. The um, thing is, is there a list of politicians who we can actually trust? Because I, I, I get the feeling... <laughs> no, I mean, what I mean is, I get the feeling if, if we get the attention on one politician who we are going to vote as long as he's with us, the other ones will take this example. And I would love to see something like that, saying like, there's a politician not caring about lobbies, but about us, I mean, people. And yeah, in case so, where can I find it? <laughs> Thanks. Um, you know the, the, the Care Bears? The, you know those bears with rainbows? No. And, uh, <laughs> maybe in the world of the Care Bears you can find such politicians, uh, I don't know. No, m more seriously, uh, in my experience of political systems, wherever they are, you have the, the small minority of the really corrupt people, another small minority of the people really caring and working, and in the middle, the vast majority of people who don't give a fuck. <laughs> so those are the people we should target in priority. We, we must find, and there are some, probably even in Spain, I don't know, some who really care, who really understand, who really get to trust you when you come to them and talk to them regularly and give them info and you tell them what, what to do once and they do it and they have positive feedback afterwards and so on and so on. So working with them, so they will do the activists within their groups and convince their colleagues while the, the whole internet will be set on, on fire and show to the ones who don't care that, well, maybe they should care a little or maybe if they don't care too much, you know, there, 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 there will be problems. So it is very uh, complex system we are trying to influence. And you cannot answer by, by yes or no, uh, or by, you know, white or, or black. But it's interesting what you said about um, the lay Sinde being your part of the actor. It's actually more complex than that and allows me for a quick comment that I should maybe have said uh, earlier. Um, Lei Sinde is a pre-ACTA legislation. Once ACTA will be adopted, ratified by the EU, if the European Parliament votes for it, then Spain at some stage will be forced to transpose it. The ACTA will become a revision of the IPRED directive that then will have to be transposed in Spain, whatever happens. So the point is to intervene as early as possible in the process. So Spain won't have to fight yet another stupid law when, if ACTA is adopted. And also, we have to see our, um, our, our battlefield as not being only the parliament and the texts that are discussed into it. We win political battles. In France, after two years of a, 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 a parliamentary Afghanistan war, the ADOPI got finally adopted, but it got adopted dead already. And it is a political defeat for the, the government in France that is still sounding every day in their ears today. So the text may be ultimately adopted because a majority is held or because the lobbyists are so powerful or the system is so screwed or whatever. But if such a high part of the population understand that this is complete bullshit and is not afraid about it and knows how to circumvent it, then this may wait in the next elections. And this is maybe yeah, part of the answer. What I, I wanted to add is that um, Lei Sinde, Adopi, ACTA, SOPA in the US are exactly the same thing. They're exactly part of the same global influence led by those uh, copyright industries, let's call them. Uh, the SOPA in the US is a mix between ACTA and between the attacks of the US government against WikiLeaks. 
It is a slightly more evolved version of ACTA because it takes the financial intermediaries as targets for uh, censorship measures. But all this is extremely well connected. And we are all extremely well connected with the people of EFF, of uh, Digital Gesellschaft, and of uh, La X in Spain, and uh, Red Sostenible, and so on and so on. So we must use this connectedness to expose the connectedness of those issues in various countries and parliaments. And in the end, I think it makes us stronger. You have something to, to add, maybe? Um, I forgot something to say because you said something about transposition um, in my part of the talk. Because uh, the child exploitation that I was working on in the beginning had the mandatory blocking of internet. Um, that we got out of the directive and uh, it's now voluntarily done by the member states. But uh, additionally we got some judicial oversight into the directive. What is important for the people who live in countries which have the blocking system already in place? With the transposition of the directive into your national law, there will be also the transposition of the judiciary oversight. Usually involving a judge means involvement of some law, so they have to pass a law on blocking, on having a blocking infrastructure. So that is the point for you during the transposition of the child exploitation directive that you make sure that you have a public discussion about blocking in your home country, which would, would mean like Sweden, uh, France, for example, Hadopi Do, uh, the second Hadopi law, and I think also Spain and uh, Italy already has a law, UK. So uh, you have to make sure that during the transposition of that directive that you get either a law on blocking or the blocking removed from your internet. So that's something I forgot in my part of the talk. Um, my question is, uh, just recently there was a decision of the European Union Court of Justice in Luxembourg that the providers are not responsible for the content. How much does this support you? Mm. Well, it's an interesting decision indeed. It's the uh, Scarlett versus Sabam case. In, in that case, in uh, Belgium, uh, Sabam, which is the equivalent of GEMA, um, asked Scarlett, an uh, internet service provider belonging to Tiscali, I think, well, here is the catalog of all the songs from all our members. You have to block all that on your network. And so the, the, the judge in uh, Brussels asked to the Luxembourg court, is that compatible with EU law? And the decision was uh, generalized blocking, not limited in time, uh, that cost has to be taken by the operator and one or two other criteria is not compatible with the EU law, which leaves open the door for non-generalized filtering or filtering that would be limited in time, or whose charge won't be on the operators. So this decision doesn't kill any attempt to censorship. It just kills the biggest, broadest, unthinkable. But the others are still open. And the decision says this is not compatible with EU law. But you know, EU law may change. Actually, it will change. European Commissioner Michel Barnier Commissioner to Internal Market, is working on the revision of the IPRED directive since he's in office. If ACTA is adopted by the European Parliament, within six months, we have a draft proposal from the Commission of a revision of IPRED that will integrate ACTA, that will require cooperation to implement measures to deter further infringement, and then the EU law may be compatible with this kind of measure. So it's not the end of the fight, far from it, but it's a very, very interesting decision and I encourage you to read it because in two different occasions it states that, yes, an IP address is personal data. Hmm. So, yeah, it's a useful decision. Um, just regarding this, uh, uh, this topic everyone knows as child por pornography, which isn't it, we, which we heard, do you know that if there is an activity in the internet, for instance from sites like groups like Anonymous or so, to um, work against these places where such photos appears, because this would help uh, the, com uh, 
the force, uh, this would help to say it's not necessary to do any other laws against this because the internet is going is doing something against it. Do you know? Because, for instance, in Germany, for right-wing servers, uh, uh, servers publishing right-wing content, there has been such kind of activities. Do you know if there are activities in this topic as well? Well, the difference is uh, whether it's about uh, speech or whether there is a victim involved for me. Um, because uh, like uh, hate speech, um, in first is victimless crime until somebody becomes a victim of hate speech. But it's not like produced by a victim or by, there's no victim in first, but second. The, the, that's the difference between child abuse images and free speech issues. The other thing is uh, it's a very serious crime and uh, I'm not a proponent of anarchy, so I see the, the, why there's a reason why we have a police force, for example. And uh, I would think that the best way probably would be that they use to learn Tor and find the hidden sites and perhaps get the cooperation of Tor operators to get that offline. But that is something, cooperation is something that the police is not very good at. So police is like used to use their truncheon and go and beat people up for not uh, cooperating. Um, on the, the part of your question, um, speaking about Anonymous, I, I don't know about Anonymous. I know n nobody who's part of Anonymous. No, I, I couldn't if I, if I wanted, n no. I know about their activities. I cannot say that I support all of them, including when some personal data is being published about individuals or users. Uh, sometimes I think it's perfectly legitimate, like a denial of service attack is the equivalent of going into a supermarket and sit into it with a political movement. It's like some kind of happening or protest. And I think that calling that, you know, pirating or attacks or destroying or whatever is, is a bit, indeed, too, too, goes too far. There, there, it's an eternal question in our uh, activist circles, I may say. How much do we stay within the boundaries of legality and how much uh, do we think it is legitimate to go outside of those limits and how far outside? So we, with La Quadrature du Net, we, we, we publish what we do and we stay within the frame of the democratic debate. We preach for civil disobedience on the regard of uh, sharing files on the internet because we, 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 we say it is legitimate it is good for culture, for the economy of culture, and so on. But this is, we could say, something minor. The question is, shall we publish the inbox of people doing such things? I mean, it's everybody to, to judge by themselves. Everyone is responsible for the actions. I will not say never do it. I will not say do it. People think for themselves. What I think very interesting is, I saw an anonymous uh, operation against SOPA, I guess, I don't know what it was about. Th there will probably be one against ACTA someday, probably. Uh, I see that as uh, hackers becoming politicized. You know, like I do, you remember a few years ago, you would talk to any hacker about politics. Ah, politics, I don't even vote, screw them, they suck, and so on. Well, recently, with uh, WikiLeaks, with the Arab Spring, with everything going uh, at once, people are more, well, well, there's something happening, you know? So to me, Anonymous, people participating in Anonymous is kind of a first step, you know, of trying to do something about it with a choice that is one way of action. And I think that the more different ways of action, as long as we go towards the same objective and that is not becoming counterproductive, and there is a very high risk of that with Anonymous. But the more parallel actions there is, the, the, the best it is in general. Was another question here? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is going to be the last question. Here's the microphone oh. for you. Yeah, I just want to make this short and go back to the uh, topic of lobbying when I um, was preparing some campaign against the uh, passenger name records uh, agreements. Um, I found it really, really frustrating to get contact information out of the um, site of the European Parliament, so I wrote a small script. And um, I just posted on the 28C3 wiki a small SQLite file that contains all the contact information 
for uh, members of the European Parliament, including the committees they're part of. So um, if you're interested in emailing them, and email them often, and everyone, everyone here should do so, search your own MEPs and email them for all different kinds of reasons. Um, go on the 28C3 wikis, search for MEP database, and um, you can download it there. I, okay, uh, yeah. Uh, the, Somebody else yeah, ignore, you also have the extensions for the phones in S there. So. Sir, I thank you and warmly congratulate you. And thank you especially for giving me the occasion to, uh, to speak a bit more about political memory. Uh, because, yeah, this is a tool we developed for some years uh, with all the, the, the data about the, the parliamentaries. I think you, you well, we chose not to give such an option to give all the email addresses at once because it would encourage some massive spamming and our approach is to recommend to send targeted emails because I think that one specifically targeted email like dear Mrs. Nana I live in the place where you were elected and I care very much and I know this and this person that you know about and I tell you this has much more weight that dear Mrs. or Mr. MEP here is what I want to tell you that's one thing Second, yes, emails can be ignored. Therefore, you should send an email and then make a phone call asking, oh, did you receive my email? No, you don't remember? I'll tell you about it. And this is very much harder to ignore. And if so, if there are 100 phone calls coming on the same day in the office and 10,000 emails, you know, you filter them, but you see the number in the filter going It really means something anyway so i encourage you you can go to the wiki to fetch that list you can also join the political memory mailing list if you know how to code python django if you know web design if you want to help the the coolest feature of all in political memory is that we record the votes of the members of the parliament and we display them over time so you can see compared to the average of the parliament where one member stands is he a friend of us, or is he an enemy? Is he learning, or is he getting convinced by the dark side? This is all the, the data porn we can make out of this. And I'm sure there are lots of data porn freaks around here who could help us gladly. So this is one, one example of using technology, using our hacking skills to do concrete uh, bits of the internet that will raise the political cost for them to take the bad decision next time they will have to take a decision. And this is once again um, a play in which all of us have a role. And yeah, thank you very much. And if maybe you have something to add, Christian. Well, I thank you too. And uh, I think really um, we should not forget that there are tools out there. We should not always reinvent the wheel. Sometimes we have to reinvent the wheel, but uh, political memory, uh, the second version is very good. And so please, if you are working on the European Parliament, please use political memory and therefore make it even more valuable than it already is. Yes.